guys. So here we are um, talking about, um, this is actually the second to the last lecture, I believe, of um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's kind of uh, nice to know that very soon you guys will have all the information you need here. Um, but I want to, in these last two lectures, basically just walk you day by day through the crisis. So what exactly happened? Um, you know, what happened on each day? Because the story as it unfolds, I find it really compelling. And I, I hope you guys do too. I hope that you see um, the the critical decisions and some of the um, issues that had happened and things that had come up before and how they affect this crisis and the decisions that are going to be made as we walk through this. So I hope that all sort of becomes clear. So I've already spoken to you guys about the um, U-2 plane flyover, the discovery of those missiles, and um, that it wasn't until actually two days later, ultimately, um, on the 16th of October, that the president is informed. So let's pick up the story there. So each of these slides coming up here, many of these slides coming up here are going to have um, essentially a timeline for you. So let's follow along as we um, take a look at this timeline. So the first date uh, is October 16th. So and as I mentioned, this is the day that the president, President Kennedy, uh, and his advisors, his closest advisors, are initially informed um, by the military, by members of the State Department, that there are weapons present on Cuba. The meeting takes place um, that includes not only the president's um, uh, most important representatives and um, advisors, but also uh, members of the military, as well as the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Keep in, keeping in mind, of course, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had um, an extraordinarily hawkish perspective on these things, it shouldn't then be a surprise to you to know that their very first piece of advice was to suggest to the president that they do a quick and a divisive strike on Cuba. Um, their, the, the number one benefit or um, sort of uh, military advantage that the U.S. had at that time was the fact that the Soviets did not know that we knew they had missiles. And so um, that whole discussion involved, you know, first of all, excuse me, <laughs> it was not only about um, the need to get rid of the missiles, but to do it quickly. Um, before the, the Soviets and the Cubans found out. Um, Kennedy, uh, and Bobby Kennedy specifically, as he was um, the, the one who really wrote this story down, his brother um, did not have time to write his memoirs, of course, because he was assassinated in 63. So Bobby Kennedy took it upon himself to write extensively about these events. And Bobby Kennedy wrote that it was... Um, there, that there was a lot of pressure coming from the Joint Chiefs, that John Kennedy felt that the Joint Chiefs um, weren't really willing to look at the dipl diplomatic options. But again, keep in mind that Kennedy was fighting this legacy of his father, of being kind of weak, being soft, and also being young. And um, nevertheless, Kennedy holds back from ordering a strike. Um, he tells the military, you know, we'll likely have to strike, but he does make the decision to pull together a group of men on his larger committee. They called uh, this group XCOM, or Executive Committee. And this committee was to meet in uh, secret to come up with various strategies for the president. Um, and so they meet in secret. And again, secrecy is of the utmost importance here because it was important not um, to have the, the Cubans or the Soviets find out. And Washington being what it was at the, that time, there really were spies everywhere. So keeping this information secret was really quite critical. So this group, XCOM, meets, and um, they are to come up with a plan or a series of plans to offer the president on how to deal with the crisis. The president at the same time has to put on this show for the American people. He has to put on this facade that, oh, he's going about his daily business, he's going on campaign trips. And so he reluctantly goes on a couple of different campaign trips over the next few days, um, trying not to alert the media to any kind of disruption or, or difficulty. And again, because of keeping this, the importance of keeping this secret. Um, so on the 17th, uh, the president, again, attempting to keep um, this crisis secret, um, 
allows XCOM to meet to come up with some strategies. And then on the 18th, um, Kennedy already had pre-arranged to meet with the Soviet ambassador, uh, Grominko. And um, he takes that opportunity to very strategically ask the Soviet Union to clarify if they had any weapons of an offensive nature on Cuba. Now, of course, the president knew that they did have weapons of an offensive nature on Cuba. and uh, But the USSR, not knowing that this, the U.S. already knew that there were weapons, um, he denies it and um, further confirms for Kennedy, um, the, the lack of trust, I suppose you could say, that, um, that their administration had in the Soviets at that time. So XCOM, as I mentioned, um, it was this executive committee. And um, it was meeting throughout this period, these, these uh, 24 hours between the time that the president was informed, um, throughout the 17th and into the 18th. And they, it is made up of you know, various parties. And we've talked about the hawks versus the doves. Um, and XCOM was very much a battle between these two ideologies. Was it going to be, uh, you know, military strikes, this hawkish attitude, these cold warriors who believed that the Soviets could not be rationed with? You know, the Kennan Doctrine had left Americans with this belief that the Soviet Union was absolutely un- able to negotiate, um, to do any kind of diplomatic negotiations that would be meaningful, especially in a situation like this. Um, but increasingly, there were members of XCOM who said, you know, the need for caution in these circumstances was was too great um, to rush into any military strategy. But this rift between the Joint Chiefs and some of the other um, members of Kennedy's administration begins to develop even within XCOM. Well, on October 20th, um, the Joint Chiefs um, continuing to press Kennedy um, about invasion. When the, the crisis started, the Joint Chiefs informed the president that he had between 10 and 14 days before the weapons would become operational. And every day that the Kennedys waited to make a decision, those weapons were getting closer and closer to becoming operational. At the same time, um, the Washington Post came to the administration with a story about uh, um, very strange um, military movements going on in the southern United States. I've said this before um, to, to my classes, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys. My dad was actually in basic training at this time, and he remembers clearly. He was in Mississippi, um, you know, as just sort of a young uh, guy, young private in the Army, and he remembers the base starting to get very, very crowded. Lots of people from all over the country, um, military uh, um, convoys are bringing in um, hundreds, thousands of um, members of the U.S. military as well as planes and other kinds of weapons and amassing them in the southern United States. And it makes sense. The, the, the military, the Joint Chiefs in particular, were absolutely co uh, convinced that they were going to have to strike, that they were either going to have to do airstrikes or uh, a land invasion or some combination of both. And so the Washington Post noted this and went to the Kennedy administration and asked them, what's going on here? Um, the Kennedy administration, in a move that's probably more common than most of us realize, um, convinced the Washington Post to hold off on their story. Imagine that. Imagine the president saying, please, please don't publish this story. National security is absolutely um, at stake if you publish this story. Now, the, the press in the United States is a free press. They, they are not controlled um, by um, the government. And lucky for us, right? We wouldn't want a press that was controlled by the government. Nevertheless, for the press to actually, and especially a paper like the Washington Post, um, to hold back on this story is a, is a pretty um, stunning move. But it really can um, give you some sense of not only um, the, the magnitude of this particular issue, but also um, the, the relationship that the Kennedy administration had with the press. So on October 21st, um, XCOM convenes with the larger committee um, that the president had initially convened on the first day and proposes not a first strike invasion strategy, although that is on the table, but a naval quarantine is proposed. There is a great deal of 
sort of angst and trepidation about this decision. The military feel that this naval quarantine or blockade was a disastrous mistake. Essentially, what they were saying was, let's uh, set it up so that we put all of our ships basically surrounding Cuba, and we say we are not letting any more ships come in. Now, remember, these weapons weren't fully armed at this point. And so not only would the goal have been to stop any more nuclear weapons or, you know, um, components for weaponizing those, um, those machines, not only would it the blockade or the, the stop... Um, the, the blockade line, so stopping those ships from coming through, not only would that keep any additional weapons from coming in, but it would also send a message to the Soviet Union that, you know, we were ready to dance, like we were ready to fight. For a second, think about this strategy. So the military is saying we have to strike. These weapons could be ready at any time. We did not even know if they needed any more components. The U.S. government was operating with very shallow information, very little information. So assuming that any of those ships that were still on their way from the Soviet Union to Cuba were even necessary to make these weapons work was a huge stretch. Um, but again, the alternative was to strike. And the Kennedy administration felt strongly that that would be the beginning of World War III. But if we didn't strike and the Cubans weaponized those, uh, those nuclear weapons and, you know, um, launched one at the United States, that also could be disastrous. So it's a horrible position that the Kennedy administration finds themselves in. Kennedy agrees uh, with the sort of more dovish decision, and he decides to, um, to go with the blockade. So I just want to clarify, because I don't know if I've done a super good job here explaining to you what I mean by a blockade. The idea is, and it's sort of, you know, an old naval technique, you basically line your ships up I mean, they're not going to be nose to nose, but you, you line them up within a particular corridor and um, you basically send out a message to all incoming ships that no ships will be allowed through. And what that meant was if you send a ship across this line, if any ship goes sort of past this blockade line, we'll blow it out of the water. Now, blowing a ship out of the water it's itself could have launched World War III. So the Kennedy administration didn't want that. What they wanted was they wanted to send a message to Cuba and to the Soviet Union that we will not stand for this, while at the same time not going so far as to start World War III. I mean, what a delicate line to draw there. On October 22nd, President Kennedy goes on television to formally announce um, that there will be a quarantine or a cutting off of Cuba. No ships will be allowed to go through. And when Kennedy does this, he um, not only does he announce it to the American people, but he announces officially to the Soviet Union that he knows about the nuclear weapons, and it's sort of game on. From that point, our biggest advantage of that secrecy is revealed. But what the Kennedy administration hoped was that um, the, the Soviets would get the message that if they stepped one more toe over the line, that this was going to come to war. Kennedy was constantly having to weigh um, what he knew about the Soviets. I mean, did the Soviets want war? Or were they as, as were they as afraid of war as we were? What were the purposes of purpose? What was the purpose of those weapons? Was it truly to to bring war, or was it simply to um, uh, sort of threat uh, and and to make a threat rather, or to threaten? And Kennedy believed that the Soviets did not intend or desire a war, and for that reason, um, he sort of put himself out there, and on the evening of October 22nd, 1962, President Kennedy goes on television and begins his remarks, good evening, my fellow citizens. 
Now, on this slide, you will see a photograph of President Kennedy sitting at his desk, um, but also you will see the text, or sorry, a YouTube, a link to a YouTube video. I want you to go to that video, either one of those videos, and watch um, the film of uh, President Kennedy's speech and to listen carefully to his description of what was going to happen there. So you can pause this, and then you can go on to uh, that video. But, um, but when you come back to this film, um, we're, we're going to move on and, and start talking about the reaction of, of Americans in the next few days. You can probably imagine um, people's reaction. The, this is a photograph of a group of women um, uh, protesting or you know, uh, holding up protest signs. Um, peace or perish, right? I mean, that people felt President Kennedy be careful. People knew this was frightening. As a matter of fact, um, Catholic churches, as this crisis began to um, heighten, Catholic churches um, opened their doors for 24-hour confession and absolution. And um, it was so that, you know, people could be absolved of their sins in the event that there was a nuclear holocaust. So, again, like, let that sink in for a second. This is what people believed was about to happen. Um, on October 23rd, the Organization of American States actually uh, voted to support the U.S. quarantine. And this is another important reason for the blockade or the quarantine as opposed to a strike. President Kennedy needed the international community to support him. You know, the United States is this big, giant country. We've already tried to invade with the Bay of Pigs, and that was a huge international disaster. But so, too, have we tried to assassinate Castro. Frankly, the Cubans were starting to look like the picked-on neighbor kid from down the street, and we were looking like a big bully. And so one of the kind of really smart decisions or smart components to the Kennedy decision in terms of... Um, the quarantine and the blockade was by resisting this urge to take direct military action against the Cubans, we could gather international support. Because everybody who, you know, was on our side anyway, all, all of our friends knew that the Cubans having these mess missiles was absolutely, um, like we couldn't, we couldn't tolerate that. But, um, but again, the military was not on board with this. And one of the signs of this was that the U.S. military raised the Defensive Readiness Condition, or DEFCON, from DEFCON 4 to DEFCON 3. Now, DEFCON is a system that was put in place during the Cold War in order to indicate like what level of military readiness our, our military forces were at. Now, DEFCON 4 is what we're at today. It's sort of the, you know, kind of like general alertness. But DEFCON 3 takes it up one more notch. And the defensive readiness um, condition is, is a, and especially it was at that time, a very particular message. Um, and it sent a very strong message to the Soviets that we were mounting for war. And according to some accounts, the Kennedy administration was, was very angry that the military had raised the DEFCON level um, and potentially had signaled to the Cubans and to the Soviets that we were preparing for war. And this isn't what Kennedy wanted. He wanted the Cubans to just, and everybody to just chill out. They wanted the blockade to work and for the um, Soviets to get into a negotiating position. And on October 24th, the quarantine itself begins. And it was, for the most part, successful. All ships, except for one, which um, slipped through the boundary line, all of them stopped or turned around. And um, President Kennedy saw this as a success. You know, the one ship that, you know, um, got, went through the, uh, the, the quarantine line may not have gotten the message, it may have mis misunderstood, um, you know, where the line was. And so the Kennedy administration made a choice not to attack that ship. But despite this success, I mean, the Kennedys felt, okay, here we are, we've got this great success of this quarantine. And on the 24th, the military once again raises the DEFCON level to DEFCON. 
Khan II. This is the highest level of military readiness that the United States military had ever been to at that point. There have only been two times in American history when we have raised our threat level and our readiness level to DEF CON 2. Once was during the Cuban Missile Crisis and once was immediately following September 11th. And again, Kennedy was enraged. This is the military potentially signaling to the Soviets that we were ready for war. And the delicacy of this negotiation was so intense, Kennedy felt that this was just absolutely disastrous. Now, ultimately, um, what it indicates to me as a historian is, th again, this internal conflict between the Kennedys and the military. On the 25th, Amidst all of this quarantine and all this tension um, between uh, the U.S. and the military, the executive committee or XCOM discusses the possibility of removing weapons that are currently in Greece and Turkey in exchange for weapons in Cuba. The argument against this was that, you know, you don't want to be trading missiles for missiles, you know. If you're, if you're trading missiles in Greece and Turkey for missiles in Cuba, then all the Soviets have to do is threaten to put missiles, you know, in Argentina, and then what are we, then what are we going to trade for? What if they threaten to, you know, put missiles in Mexico? Then what are we going to trade? Um, and so this notion of trading becomes, uh, while it's floated by the administration, um, it definitely becomes controversial. Um, on October 26th, the, there was a KGB station chief um, and Soviet spy who comes sort of out of the woodwork and through several back channels contacts ABC News. Now, this KGB station chief um, was believed to have very close links to uh, Khrushchev himself. And basically what this KGB station chief tells um, uh, ABC News, and then ABC News passes on to the administration, um, that they will dismantle their weapons in Cuba if the U.S. promises never to invade Cuba. Um, sounds like a great idea. I mean, think about it. So they will dismantle their weapons in Cuba if the U.S. promises never to invade. Khrushchev sends a letter to the Kennedy administration confirming that this deal could go through. And on the afternoon of October 26, the Kennedy administration thinks they have a deal. So this is where I'm going to stop. Um, and you'll have to find out what happens, whether this deal goes through in the next lecture. So, all right. Thank you.